Hi everyone, and welcome to Shukin Science. In this video, we're going to go through the four main stages of aerobic cell respiration as performed in a eukaryotic cell. So starting with glycolysis. The main purpose of glycolysis is to make a molecule called pyruvate. This process, it does not require any oxygen. And so it can actually be used by anaerobic organisms as well. Not only that, but it can be performed by prokaryotic cells because you'll notice that glycolysis takes place outside of the mitochondria. So it actually occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell, which means you don't need a mitochondria to do glycolysis. By the end of this reaction, there is a net gain of two ATP molecules. And if you recall, that's actually the main point of aerobic respiration or all respiration. All organisms do cell respiration to make this molecule here. But two ATP is just simply not enough to sustain multi-celled organisms. So if you're a single cell prokaryote, you can afford just to do glycolysis. But if you're an aerobic eukaryotic cell, you need a few more than two ATPs. And so that's where the other steps are going to come into play. But before we get to those steps, let's take a look at how this happens. So glycolysis begins with this familiar six carbon compound called glucose. Now, if you are a heterotrophic organism like animals, you need to eat in order to get glucose into your cells. Whereas if you're a plant, you can actually create your own using that magical process of photosynthesis. So to start off glycolysis, glucose with the help of two molecules of ATP is broken down into two three carbon compounds called G3P. And if you've seen the video on the light independent reactions of photosynthesis, this should make sense because we know that G3P is the building block of glucose. So when I use ATP to essentially split that glucose in half, we get two of those G3P molecules. But G3P isn't quite the same thing as pyruvate. Remember, the goal of glycolysis is to make pyruvate. So a couple of additional modifications need to take place in order to convert the G3P into a similar three carbon compound called pyruvate. Now, for our purposes, we don't need to know the details of this reaction. However, what we do need to understand is that in addition to those two pyruvate molecules, these reactions where G3P is modified to make pyruvate also release two ATP molecules and a molecule called NADPH. Oh, sorry, NADH. We're not on photosynthesis. Okay, so that means that from these reactions, there's actually four ATP produced However, because two were required in order to initiate the reactions, we see that there is a net gain of two ATPs. So eventually we have our pyruvate molecules. We have a little bit of ATP, but like I said, not quite enough to sustain our cells. And then we do have this molecule called NADH. Now we don't know much about that yet, but as we'll see later, NADH is going to come in very handy for our last step in this process. And I also want to point out once again that no oxygen is required anywhere in these reactions. So that's why we could consider glycolysis to be an anaerobic process. Okay, so once that pyruvate is created, it can then move into the intermembrane space of the mitochondria. Now, before it can go on and enter the matrix, it needs to undergo a small modification to create a molecule called acetyl coenzyme A. And that is the main 
purpose of this linking reaction. This reaction does require oxygen and it does not make any ATPs. So let's take a look at that reaction then. During the linking reaction, our two pyruvate molecules, I'm just gonna draw one of them, but we can just keep in mind that that should be multiplied by two. They are modified in a couple of different ways. You don't need to know all the complex reactions that happen here, but you do need to know that one of those little modifications involves removing a carbon atom. So our pyruvate is modified now to a two carbon compound. And then because that carbon is released, it needs something to bind with. We can't just have carbon building up in the cell like that. And so that is where oxygen comes into play oxygen will bind with that extra carbon atom so that it can be released as CO2. So that is the purpose of oxygen in the linking reaction, is to get rid of that extra carbon and we then exhale that as carbon dioxide. Okay, lastly, our new two carbon compound then binds with an enzyme called coenzyme A and this new compound then is called acetyl coenzyme A. This is the molecule that can enter the matrix of the mitochondria and then the Krebs cycle, our next step, can get going. In addition to this CO2 that's produced during this reaction, we should also know that another molecule of this NADH is also produced. which again, will go on to help fuel our electron transport chain. So now that we have the acetyl coenzyme A, it can enter the matrix of the mitochondria and the Krebs cycle can begin. Man, is the Krebs cycle complex. There are a whole bunch of steps that you can learn all about, not for the purpose of this course though. Um, you can actually take a whole university course on it if you are so inclined. It's actually pretty interesting. But basically what happens is our acetyl coenzyme A molecules, remember there are two of these, they undergo a whole bunch of reactions, basically getting broken down and facilitating other reactions over and over and over. What we need to know are the products of these reactions. So, one of the first sets of reactions goes on to produce three more molecules of this NADH that we had gotten previously. And again, remember this is happening twice since there's two acetyl coenzyme A's. So technically we get six molecules of NADH. This set of reactions is then also going to remove another carbon. So now we're going from two carbons to one that excess carbon is going to bind with oxygen to make, once again, carbon dioxide. So that's why in the Krebs cycle, oxygen is required. And it, again, helps a carbon atom be released as CO2. Another set of the reactions in the Krebs cycle is going to produce a molecule called FADH2. And FADH2 is similar to NADH in that it's a high energy compound. In fact, these two molecules are the main purpose of the Krebs cycle. We want to make NADH and FADH2 because those high energy molecules are going to go on to donate their electrons to power up this electron transport chain. And then lastly, we do get a measly little ATP molecule produced during the Krebs cycle. Again, since it's happening twice, there's technically two of them, which means that we have so far two ATPs produced in total, which really is not a lot. Once the Krebs cycle is complete, now we have our 
NADH and FADH2 in the matrix of the mitochondria. And then they are going to start to get passed along proteins that are embedded in this inner mitochondrial membrane. And you don't need to know the names of the different proteins or exactly how those reactions take place. What you do need to know is as those molecules are passed down those proteins, the reactions are used to help pump hydrogen ions into this intermembrane space. So in the big picture of things, our hydrogen ions are building up in here, still in the mitochondria, but just in the intermembrane space. And this might look familiar. Yes, we are creating a hydrogen ion gradient, which means that as hydrogen builds and builds and builds, eventually it is going to get passed through this final protein in the electron transport chain, which again looks familiar because this protein is called ATP synthase. And ATP synthase helps facilitate reactions that make ATP, specifically a reduction reaction. So ADP is then reduced to ATP. And boy, does it make a lot of ATP. Due to the high surface area, lots of ATP is being produced. And even through one set of these proteins, there's actually approximately 34 ATP produced in ideal conditions. So that means that in total, we have 34, 5, 6, 7, 38 ATP being produced from just one round of cell respiration if conditions are ideal. And that is the main purpose of the electron transport chain is obviously to make lots and lots of ATP. Okay, we have one last thing to pay attention to, and that is what happens to the remnants of this electron transport chain. So there is some hydrogen that's left over at the end, and what it's going to do is bind to oxygen, and then it's going to be released from the cell as water. So in the electron transport chain, oxygen is also required. However, it serves a slightly different purpose than in our previous steps. Here, the oxygen bound to carbon dioxide, whereas here, it binds to excess hydrogen ions and is released as H2O. So that is aerobic cell respiration. There's lots of steps lots of complex details. And so if you stay tuned for the next video, I'll do a quick summary of all that for you. Thanks everyone.